Your love is like radiant diamonds bursting inside us. We cannot contain. Your love will surely come find us like blazing wildfires singing your up in the morning, is it not? Welcome to Spouse Springs Church. My name is Rich Gensho. I'm the worship creative arts pastor. So glad you could join us online here on campus. Welcome home. Whenever we, whenever you come here, you're part of the family. So just welcome home. Be a part of what God's doing here at Spouse Springs. We're going to continue on the worship and because uh, worship's the time we pull away from the worries of the week and set our mind on God and, and listen to what he has to say and nothing sets our heart in a better stage for that than to praise him and to thank him for all the things that he does and will continue to do. So let's continue on in worship. Good God Almighty, I hope you'll find me praising your name no matter what comes. Come on, clap on. I can't count the times I've 
called your name some broken night And you showed up and patched me up like you do every time I get amnesia I forget that you keep coming around Yeah, ain't no way you'll ever let me down Could God I'm a Friends, take your seats for just a few moments. Well, hey, good morning, everyone. I was reading not too long ago that uh, one teacher in particular, when her school year ends, that's when a new phase begins. And what she does is she starts buying school supplies. She checks things. She's got a whole system where she goes to different, you know, the dollar stores and the family dollars and all those dollar stores and all those kinds of things. And she looks for really cheap crayons and pencils and anything that she might need and she slowly builds up that reserve that she needs for the next school year and she takes about three months to do that uh, spending her own money so that she can get those things together for next year's students and that's something that is pretty commonplace uh, a lot of teachers they spend their own money uh, one survey said that roughly it's about four hundred and fifty dollars a year of their own money on school supplies for the kids. And something that uh, you just helped us do, we had a drive where we were able to get together school supplies and we put together 161 backpacks. And y'all did that. Uh, not us, not the staff, uh, people that attend church here, put that drive together, put it out there, gathered the supplies, you brought them in, and you were able to help not just 161 kids, but also the teachers of those kids, so that they're not spending their own money. And let me tell you one more thing. It's not just crayons and pencils and paper. Sometimes it's toothpaste and a toothbrush. Sometimes it's snacks because they haven't had any breakfast. So y'all have done an amazing thing. I cannot thank you enough for this. Uh, I know that the teachers are very thankful. I know the students are thankful. And it's just one more thing that Spouse Rings does that makes me a very, very happy camper when it just comes to the fact that I'm a part of this church. Uh, you're always doing amazing things, and I appreciate it very, very much. And so that's all I wanted to share with you this morning. Well, I'm going to share some other stuff, obviously. But the main thing I wanted to share was...
just thank you for that. Y'all did a great job, okay? So every week, we set aside a time we can give as uh, God has asked us to, and the best way, the easiest way to do that is to download our Spout Springs app. Uh, when you do that, at the bottom, just type in Spout Springs. At the bottom, there's a giving tab. You hit that, and it will, you can set something up there. I also invite you to please download our app, see what events are coming up. Uh, there's some events, there's some ministry opportunities. This Saturday, we're going to have a cleanup day for the Sentinel Challenge, but if you pull up the app, look at the events, you can see everything that's going on there, okay? All right, folks, let's go ahead and take a moment now and just say a prayer of thanks. Father, we thank you so much that you are using the people in this church to not just go to church, but to be the church. Father, I thank you for the opportunities that you've put before us, and I pray that you would continue to use us, help us to see what you see, help us to feel what you feel when it comes to just the, the needs that are taking place in the community around us. And I pray, Lord, that you would use us to make an impact on this community for your name and for your kingdom. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, if you'll please stand back up. Uh, we're going to sing uh, a little bit more with Rich. Thank you. You're a man of your word. Watch the screen.
good? Doing right? Uh, um, you may not have ever noticed this, or you may have. If you're, kind of, if you're in the auditorium today, when you come into the gym, there's a, a flag over on the side there, and if you look underneath it, there, there's a cross. And what you may or may not know, if, you, if you're new, you probably not know this, that's actually a memorial. Um, we had that put up a number of years ago, and at the base of it, there is a plaque. It's for Sam Harrison. He was a friend of mine. Uh, he was killed in Afghanistan in 2014, and I'll never, ever, ever escape the sound of his wife's voice when she called early that morning to tell me they lost Sammy. Um, so when I see the stuff in Afghanistan, I, I, I don't re. I, it, it's a, it's conflicting. It's challenging. It's it's hard for me. And then I think of many of you, where you've got a number of friends who would have plaques. He happens to be the only person in our church who we lost during the war effort. But I know many of you have loved ones, many have friends, and I know that. When the news starts talking about interpreters and people that helped, for some of you, for some of us, that's just a word, interpreters. For some of you, that's a name. That's a guy. That's a friend who was beside you, protected you. It's a name with a wife and kids and you know the wife's name and you know the kids' names. So for a lot of our church, it's been a really hard time. A really hard few days, few weeks. Very conflicting, very challenging, very, what, what am I supposed to feel? And it's always, um, it frequently amazes me because I plan my sermon series months in advance. You can ask, I send out spreadsheets to numerous people and say, here's what I'm going to preach on in the course of the next few months. And how God sometimes knows what he's up to. <laughs> sometimes. Because I've been wanting to do a series, that humorous little series called The Bible's Best Butts, because it's such an awesome word. I've been wanting to do it for years, and there was no doubt that one of those butts was going to come out of Daniel chapter 3, which is an absolutely amazing story. And one of my favorite events in, in the history of the Bible is when those three guys, you may know them as the three Hebrew children, or if you're from the 90s, as Rakshak and Benny. If you didn't get that, I'm sorry, you didn't grow up with Veggie Tales, and I can't, I can't fix that right now for you. Uh, but when those three guys say but, their, their statement of but is, man, it's good. Man, it's powerful. Man, it gets me every time. It's one of those that I speed up to get to because I want to hear them say it. Because when I read the Bible, I hear it. I don't just see it. I hear it. I, the stories are so real to me, so alive to me, that when I'm reading them, I am in there with them, and it's, it's awesome. Okay? And they confront a question in Daniel chapter 3. And here's the question they're confronting. And let me see if you think this is relevant. How can you best live in an environment that is at odds with your values? How do you live when the world around you has different values than yours? How do you live when the government you work for has different values than yours? How do you live when your culture's values don't match up with your own? And these three guys are going to teach us an incredibly important lesson that I think is incredibly relevant to us today. It's relevant all the time, but it's just there's a spotlight shining on it in my mind right now. Okay? So we're going to end up in Daniel chapter 3, but we're going to take our time to get there because we've we got, we got to make sure we understand what's going on. Because anytime you get to a story in the Bible, you almost always need to get a background, get a run at it. Let me say one thing real fast. 
Some of you were raised, unfortunately, that the word story means fiction. It does not. Story means something that is a story. Some stories are true. Some stories are not true. The story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I believe to be true. But I'm going to use the word story because that's the right word and you can just get over it, okay? If you were raised that way, I'm sorry. It's your parents' fault, not mine. Okay. So... The run-up to it is the nation of Israel has been given God's standards, God's laws. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. And they have failed repeatedly to live up to them. They have actually rejected them. And there comes a point toward the end of their primary history in that time frame where their kingdom is going to end. They're going to be overrun eventually by the Babylonians. We would call them the Iraqis. And they're going to come and they're going to take them away. And when they're going to take them away, they're actually going to, they're not just going to suppress the land, they're going to take what they consider some of the best and the brightest and they're going to move them to Iraq, to Babylon, to be part of their nation. And they're going to build their nation by taking the best and brightest out of the nation of Israel. And there's a prophet, and he's, he lived a few, well, he lives at the same time as our guys, but his, he writes something a few years before our guys get to Babylon. And under the, uh, under the inspiration of God, he tells them how to live once they get there, or how to live while they're there. Jeremiah wrote a letter from Jerusalem to the elders, priests, prophets, and all the people who have been ex exiled to Babylon by King Nebuchadnezzar. And, and, and here's what he tells them. Here's how I want you to live in this land. You're going to be in a nation that is their values and your values are not going to match up, okay, at all. But you're going to be there a while, okay? He says, build homes and plan to stay. Plant gardens, eat the food they produce. Marry and have children, then find spouses for them so you may have many grandchildren. Multiply, do not dwindle away. In other words, you're going to be there your lifetime. Your lifetime is going to be spent in this culture that disagrees with you your entire life. And then after he says, make sure you hold on to yourself, he says, and work for the peace and prosperity of the city where I sent you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it for its welfare will determine your welfare. Okay? And here's what he tells them. Really simple. Maintain your identity, but support your nation. Maintain your identity, but you support your nation. This is huge. This is absolutely ginormous. This is one... It, nobody, nobody thinks of this immediately. This is one of the most important teachings in the entire Bible. Because Have you ever thought about the fact that you know who, who the Jews are. You still know who people who are Jewish. You probably have friends who are Jewish. There's Jewish people in just about every nation on earth. Um, how many Hittites do you know? How about Amorites? Honestly, how many Babylonians do you know? Because that culture is gone long ago. There may be some Iraqis living there now, but it's a different culture. Why are there still Jews? Well, one thing is, of course, God's provision. God is protecting them. But there's another thing. God's protection frequently, almost usually, involves him giving you wisdom in how to survive. He very rarely puts this bubble around you so that nothing can get to you. What he does is he gives you wisdom on how to live in your environment so you can survive. And God gives the Israelis, the Jewish people, this wisdom to maintain your identity but support their nation. And they still do it to this day, and there are still millions of Jews. And they outnumber Hittites really big. Okay? Well, so that's what he tells the Jewish people. Well, you, you fast forward, we're going to fast forward now, a few hundred years, and Jesus comes, Jesus lives his perfect life, dies for our sins, goes to heaven. The new church is started. And as the church is reading this stuff in Jeremiah and the exile, they realize, you know, we have a lot in common with those people living in exile. Our lives, we're very much living in a nation that's not our own. We're very much having to maintain our identity and support our nation and live in that way. Okay? So that it doesn't take long, Peter writes, Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. In other words, maintain your identity. You're going to be in a culture that disagrees with what you believe in? Maintain your identity. Um, 1 Thessalonians, Paul puts it this way. Make it your goal to live a quiet life, minding your own business and working with your hands, just as we connected before. Then people who are not Christians will respect the way you live, and you will not need to de depend on others. Okay? So, he's telling them, they're telling, they're bringing early on, 
that this is challenging for us. Our identity in Christ is more important than our national identity. That's a heavy truth. That's a heavy truth in this room. That's a heavy truth for those of you watching online. But that is the biblical statement. Our national identity is not as important as our spiritual identity. We are the children of God. We are the followers of Christ. That is our number one identity. Now, we support, we encourage, we build our nation. But Paul, having thought it through pretty carefully, said, put it this way, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though, God, as though God were making his appeal through us, we are ambassadors for Christ assigned here. Does that make sense? You following that? That is our primary thing. We are ambassadors, okay? So he says, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. So we are here to advance God's causes in our culture. That's why I am here. That's why you are here. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, God left you here because God's causes needs to be advanced in this culture. Anybody who's a Christian would say, oh boy, do God's causes need to be advanced in our culture. And that's why we're here. But we maintain our identity and support and build our nation. How? Oh, by the way, can I, can I tell you how important this... I'm going to say this, because some of you guys like history. This whole thing of you live in your nation, you support your nation, and maintain your identity... It is so huge throughout history that if you read the Declaration of Independence, the Declaration of Independence spends a good bit of its time defending the idea and promoting the idea that it's okay for us to overthrow the government. Matter of fact, if you go back to around the time of the Revolutionary War, you'll see lots of tracts and pamphlets and books that are written to say, you know what, I know what Jeremiah said, but if they start acting a certain way, we can overthrow the government. And an awful lot of the Declaration of Independence is a response to Jeremiah. That's how powerful this is. And so how do we live it? We've decided we're not overthrowing anything right now. Say right. Okay, all right. <laughs> just checking, because you know, the glare, I can't see you very well today. So I, I, it's like I'm just, I'm just hoping you're still out there, honestly. Okay. The first thing we know that it says how to, how to live in this thing, we're going to get to Daniel and Meshach and all those guys, is to live graciously. We saw that earlier when he was talking about you know, be qu live quietly. And matter of fact, in Peter also, he put it this way. If someone asks about your Christian hope, always be ready to explain it, but do this in a gentle and respectful way. Keep your conscience clear. Then if people speak against you, they'll be ashamed when they see what a good life you live because you belong to Christ. We are to live graciously in the middle of this world, setting an example of how we think life should be lived, even when the values are opposed to us. When, when we see, when we let ourselves get to this point, or we see Christians getting hostile and angry and yelling, we're doing it wrong. Because, A, when we're getting angry, it means we're not trusting God. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. And when we get really angry, we're not personifying who Jesus is and what it's about. Okay? So we live graciously, but expect opposition. Not everybody's going to be happy with the fact that we stand up for values that are not their values. We, we're, we're going to have some people come in and do some talking about some, uh, an issue recently, and they had to give us some pointers, because they're like, man, if you do this wrong, you'll have protesters, and you don't want protesters. That's the world we live in. Okay. Paul put it this way when he's talking about ambassador. He says, I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare the good news fearlessly as I should. I'm an ambassador in chains. I am living graciously, but I'm expecting that no matter how graciously I live, there are going to be some people who get upset at me. There are going to be people who have a conflict with me. And now, we can go to Daniel chapter 2. I mean, chapter 3. Because now we have the background to have a little bit of a sense as where these because we're gonna watch three guys live this out. We're gonna watch them live exactly what we've talked about, and we're gonna learn a little bit more about how to do it as we go through this. Let's just start reading. We're, I'm gonna read a bunch because it's a really great, it's a great story, and it, it doesn't really need that much, that much help from me. Okay? King Nebuchadnezzar made a gold statue 90 feet tall and 9 feet wide and set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. And some people will go, 90 feet tall? How do you make a statue 90 feet tall? It's, it's hard. 
That's nine stories, if you're curious. That's a nine-story building height statue. But you may have heard of the Colossus of Rhodes as one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was taller than that. Statue of Liberty is twice that tall. So it's doable, especially if you are the most powerful and richest man on earth, which is what Nebuchadnezzar was at that point. He was easily the richest, most powerful man on earth. And so when he wants to build a 90-foot statue, he builds a 90-foot statue, okay? What in the world? Then he sent messages to the high officers, officials, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the provincial officials. What in the world was that? Message to the high, pr- high officers, officials, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the... Pro- what? What? Why such a list? Why didn't he say he sent for everybody? If you're important, come. Here's what's going on. Nebuchadnezzar rules a huge, huge region. And if you notice, different regions call their, their leaders and their elected officials and their administrators different things. So he's saying, if you call him this, show up. If you call him this, show up. I don't care if you call him a city councilman. I don't care if you call him a solicitor. I don't care what you call the person in your community who runs your stuff, send them. If they're remotely important, send them. That's what he's saying. I want everybody, because I want everybody to come. Right? So all these officials came and stood before the statue King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then a herald shouted out, People of all races and nations and languages, listen to the king's command. When you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and other musical instruments, we're going to have an orchestra. Bow to the ground to worship King Nebuchadnezzar's gold statue. And for us, this is weird. Because, A, we don't bow to statues. It probably wasn't a statue of Nebuchadnezzar. It's probably of a god that he worshipped. Because they didn't tend to make statues of themselves. Um, as idols but it's also a political event see we have this thing where we separate church and state I don't know if you're aware of this America invented the separation of church and state you can discuss among yourselves where exactly that happened at but we invented it if you go to Great Britain the queen is the head of the church And throughout history, normally, the normal thing throughout history has been that the political leader was head of the faith issues. And they would mingle the two. So what's happening here is is a religious slash political event. I'm going to put up a statue that represents an idol, and you're all going to worship that idol, and in worshiping that idol, you are going to be committing yourself to me. This is a, a, a test of your loyalty. It's a loyalty test. If you will stand in this big field and we'll play the music and everybody bows down, and everybody that bows down is both in some sense worshiping that idol, but more importantly they're saying they are obedient, they are loyal to Nebuchadnezzar. Does that make sense? Do you see how that works? Okay, Very, very foreign to how we think, very normal for those people. In those days when you went to a city, you would normally go to the, go to the town square or wherever and make a sacrifice to their gods because there's a bunch of them. What's the big deal? Just a little thing. Unless you're what? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the the three Jewish boys who've been brought to Babylon and are trying to maintain their identity while building their nation, living graciously but expecting opposition. And then it gets complicated. Anyone who refuses to obey will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. Oh, He's serious about this, folks. This is a big deal. He is telling everyone, because they're all going to go back to their home places, and they're going to confirm we are servants of Nebuchadnezzar. That's our king. So at the sound of the musical instruments, all the people, whatever their races or nations or language, bow to the ground and worship the gold statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Okay? Unfortunately, he says all. It wasn't really all. It was such a huge crowd that when you looked at it, it looked like all. But there were these three guys at least who didn't bow down. You know, they probably just went like this a little bit. And they're not going, wait, look at me. But, you know, they're not bowing. And whenever you live for God, it's possible you'll make an enemy or two who doesn't like the way you're doing it. And some of the astrologers went to the king and informed on the Jews. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were, like we said, Rakshak and Benny, for those of you born in the 90s, 
who you have put in charge of the province of Babylon. They pay no attention to you, your majesty. They refuse to serve your gods and do not worship the gold statue you set up. Okay? So what, it's not about religion here. It's about loyalty to the king. They are being disloyal to Nebuchadnezzar. So Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you refuse to serve my gods and to worship the gold statue I've set up? I will give you one more chance. We're going to have one more appearance. Everybody else went home, but I'm going to take you guys in front of the statue, and I'm going to bring back some more instruments, and we're going to play it again. But if you refuse, you'll be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace. And then he says something stupid. Okay, because he just can't help it. He's on a roll. He's got all the power. He's in control. And then he says, and then what God will be able to rescue you from my power? Can I give you a hint? If you're ever dealing with God and you're kind of, you ever been in a situation where you're kind of arguing with God just a little bit? Don't threaten him. Don't challenge his power. You know, don't hold up your golf club and say, God, if you're really here, you'll strike it. Because you don't know. Okay? The Psalm 2, 4, one of my favorite psalms, somebody, they're talking about the people rejecting God, and it says the one enthroned in heaven laughs. Well, the word scoffed at him. Now, so we got our guys, our t- young men, young men. They're not, they're not old guys. They're young guys. Standing before the most powerful man on earth. He says, if you don't do what I tell you to do, I'm going to throw you in that furnace over there. That's not going to go well for you. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. Okay, they're actually being rather gracious. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. Okay, so God's bigger than you. That's not my favorite part. My favorite part is what they're going to say next. Because their favorite, it's the most important thing in the whole chapter is what they're going to say next. It, this, is, this is the line. What, th- everything else that happens is secondary to what they're going to say right now. Because what they say is, but even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue you set up. But even if he doesn't. Our God is capable of rescuing us from your fiery furnace, but if our God were to appear before us right now, if we're standing, so we're standing here, Nebuchadnezzar standing there, and we're all talking, and God were to appear in human form right there and say, hey, uh, Rakshak and Benny, just letting you know, you're going to burn up. I, 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 you're doing the right thing, but I'm not rescuing you this time. Because sometimes God reaches into his physical universe and he does miraculous things, and sometimes he doesn't. Frequently he doesn't. That's why they're called miracles. If God had shown up at that moment and said to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I am not going to rescue you. You are going to die an agonizing death in that fire. They said, we're still not going to bow to your idol. We are still not surrendering our values. We're still going to live what we know God wants us to do even if it costs us our lives, even if it's painful, no matter what it is. But if not, we're not going to bow to your idol. Which gives us the last of our blanks, but I'm not nearly done. Don't compromise God's standards. Don't compromise God's standards. That's the message. See, you do what's important. What you value is what you do. Every first of the year, we get all kinds of people who try to, who, who a lot of us do this thing where we say we're going to change our actions, but we're not changing our values so they don't ever work out. You ever notice that? You ever notice the New Year's resolutions that last an hour and a half, three months, three weeks, three days? Do you know why? We want to change our actions without changing our values. You don't compromise your values. You don't compromise God's standards. This is not popular. No, no, nobody, I mean, there was nobody. Remember, there were so many people who were bowing to this idol. And I bet if you went to a bunch of, if you had exit interviews as they're leaving the field where they're bowing to this idol, they'd all say, that's no big deal. I don't really worship that God. 
That one up, I couldn't even see it. It's 90, nine, nine stories tall. I couldn't even see the thing. But, you know, it's easier. It's easier to go ahead and bow to the idol than to fight it. So we, we just bowed. Yeah, now we're, now we're going home and everybody's fine. Okay? Here's, here's, here's the thing. This is, this is tough. This is tough, and I know it's tough. And I'm telling you something that's difficult, and I don't expect you to go, wee hee. Here's what it says in Psalm 146, verse 3. Do not put your trust in princes, in human beings who cannot save. Don't put your trust in princes. Now, the New Living puts it a little differently just to help you understand it better. Don't put your confidence in powerful people. There's no help for you there. And now I'm going to say something, and this is how I'm going to get in trouble. Uh, Heather, I'm going to get emails. Because that is the real temptation. We don't call it compromise. We come up with every name in the world for it, but we never call it compromise. Because I'm 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 a I'm solid. I don't do compromise. But do my put my confidence somewhere else. And this is this is I'm going to get letters. I'll be okay with it. If your first response is to protect your party instead of proclaiming God's principles, you may be putting your trust in, prince, in princes. And I, I put the word parties in there because it's alliteration and pastors love alliteration. You can put anything there. All right, this, is, this is one I'm really going to get in trouble for. I'm going to say this, and I'm saying I just, I'm, I'm just setting an example for you. I'm not trying to, um, I'm not trying to, to make a stir but just to put, give you some perspective, because I, I, I want you to get this. I, I want it to hit you. I want you to realize it. If you're more concerned with protecting the Second Amendment than the Great Commission, there's an issue here. And again, you can take out the word Second Amendment and put in anything. I'm, I'm not an anti-gun person. I'm kind of happy with the fact that I'm fine with the fact that I'm, I would ask how many of you guys are packing, but I don't really need to know. And I'm fine with that. I'm, I'm good. We have, we have um, uh, tr training classes on how to, how to handle weapons on site. Okay, so we're not... But anytime you take anything and you put it above God's standards or God's issues or God's principles or the Great Commission or any of those things, anytime one of those things becomes your number one, that's what compromise is. That's what compromise is. Compromise isn't saying, well, you know what, I've decided that I'm just going to go ahead and I know God doesn't want me to commit adultery, but I'm just going to go and have sex with all kinds of people. That's, that's not what compromise usually is. Compromise is simply shifting your priorities so that something that's not a God priority goes above God's priorities. or anything sliding above. That's what's going on. And for all those people who were bowing down to the idol, they, their priorities were just weren't, that's just their, their priorities were there. Oh, it's more important that Nebuchadnezzar likes us than that I honor my own personal worship. That's what's going on. For every one of them. It is almost inconceivable that of that sea of people who were at that event that any of them even recognized that God up on top of that podium assuming it's what that was that any of them were like yeah, that's my number one God right there yeah that, that's I'm a big fan I've, I've got I've got t-shirts I've got the paraphernalia I've got the incense things I got the whole thing for that God none of them well not none but hardly any of them would have been, that's my number one God right there, but they had no trouble walking out and bowing. Because compromise is easy, as long as it's small. Where does your brain go when situations happen? Does your brain go, okay, here's God's principles, how should I live those out? Or here's my group, my tribe, the stuff I want. Go ahead and send me the emails. I'm trying to. I'm, I'm doing this lovingly because if you're messed up, you're messed up, and I'm not supposed to let you just be messed up, even if it's subtle. It's not. Sorry. How do you think this is going to go? Anybody? You guys have read the. You guys read it, right? You've seen the cartoon. You know how this is going to go. But let's go ahead and read it. Nebuchadnezzar was so furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that his face became distorted with rage. He commanded the furnace be heated seven times hotter than usual. 
Then he ordered some of the strongest men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So they tied them up and threw them into the furnace, fully dressed in their pants, turbans, robes, and other garments. And because the king in his anger had demanded such a hot fire in the furnace, the flames killed the soldiers as they threw the three men in. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, securely tied, fell into the roaring flames. Remember what Nebuchadnezzar had said before, just as a reminder? He'd said, and then what God will be able to rescue you from my power? And God snickered. But suddenly Nebuchadnezzar jumped up in amazement and exclaimed to his advisors, didn't we tie up three men and throw them into the furnace? Yes, your majesty, we certainly did, they replied. Look, Nebuchadnezzar shouted, I see four men, unbound, walking around in the fire, unharmed, and the fourth looks like a god. In other words, when they got thrown into the fire, their clothes didn't burn, but the ropes did. And the fourth looks like a god, and most people think that's probably a pre-Bethlehem appearance of Jesus. Showing up just to say, let's just remind everybody who's really in control here. Okay. Then Nebuchadnezzar came as close as he could to the door of the flaming furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stepped out of the fire. Then the ki- And by the way, they stepped out of the fire. Let me just say one thing. It says, um, I didn't read the whole thing. They didn't even smell like smoke. Their clothes weren't singed. Their hair wasn't singed. I mean, you ever, ever lost an eyebrow to a birthday cake? Nothing, no singed anything. Then the king promoted Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego to even higher positions in the province of Babylon. Now, what I want to do for that, I'm just going to finish up pretty quick here, I think, probably. Or not. I want to talk about what the wrong lesson to take from this passage is. I'm going to tell you what the right lesson is. Because I'm afraid we tend toward the wrong lesson. As Christians, we look at this and we see, oh, look at this, God comes riding in on the horse and he rescues us. And that's what God does. So the wrong lesson is, if you live right, God will, if I live right, God will get me out of trouble. There's a couple of huge problems with that. If you look at this and say, well, they were living for God, so God got them out of the fire. Isn't that awesome? He'll do the same for me. The problem is, what? He frequently doesn't. Right? That's, 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 you ever been in trouble? I have this, I have this thing I've, I've observed. I, I get to this point where I'm really, really beat up, and I'm really going, oh, God, if you could just rescue... That would, it would be so good if this situation could just go away now. Lord, if, if you could just send an email or a letter or a check or a something, if it could show up today, that would be awesome. Or if just a friend could just wander by and, and lay wisdom upon me that would p- give me peace, that would be great. And I always get up the next morning because I, I do my best stressing at night. And you know what usually happens the next morning? Absolutely nothing happens the next morning. The alarm goes off, I get out of bed, I trudge through my thing, I make my smoothie, I go on with my day. And nothing changes. I hardly ever get light. Anybody, anybody, anybody here get lightning bolts a lot? Where God just, when you're, in, when you're discouraged, God just rains angel choruses on your head. Or, or money when there's a problem. Not if I live right, God will get me out of trouble. Matter of fact, this, this is Hebrews chapter 11. We go way, way into the New Testament. There's this thing called, we call it the Hall of Faith. It's, it's a chapter that's full of people who just live for God. And it's, and it's such a, it's, it's like you're going, yeah, 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 the whole time. By faith, these people overthrew kingdoms, ruled with justice, received what God had promised them. They shut the mouths of lions. Who's that, by the way? Daniel. Quench the flames of fire. Who's that? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego escaped death by the edge of the sword. Their weakness was turned to strength. They became strong in battle and put whole armies to flight. Women received their loved ones back again from death. But sometimes I don't like but. But others were tortured, refusing to turn from God in order to be set free. They placed their hope in a better life after the resurrection. Some were jeered at and their backs were cut open with whips. Others were chained in prison. Some died by stoning. Some were sawed in half, and others were killed with the sword. 
Some went about wearing skins and, of sheep and goats, destitute and oppressed and mistreated. They were too good for this world. Sometimes God rescues us and sometimes he doesn't. And that's the reality. So the wrong lesson is that when I get in trouble, God's going to rescue me. You know what the right lesson is? If I live for God, I don't have to fear trouble. I don't have to worry about it. I'm going to probably anyway, but I don't have to. Because God's in control. And so we come to our buddies here who are living their values in a culture that denies their values. We're trying to stand up for God in a situation that doesn't work. And they're going to speak truth no matter what. They're going to say things that are right no matter what. They don't care because they said this thing. The God whom we serve is able to save us, but even if he doesn't. Is that your attitude? God is able to work in my situation. God is able to fix everything in my life. God is able... God is able to get my interpreter friend out of Afghanistan. God is able to cure me from cancer. God is able to take every problem in my life, every knot, every conflict, every one of them, and untangle them all. He's able. And if he does... I'm going to praise him for it. I'm going to stand up on Facebook and I'm going to announce that God has able and God has done his thing. I am going to proclaim and praise him for it. But if not, if my prayer isn't answered, if my knots aren't detangled, if this time cancer wins, What now? I'm still not going to bow to the idol. I'm still not going to compromise my values. I might even do something really stupid, which nobody ever does. Like get up and proclaim God was with me in the problem. God was with me in the conflict in my heart. God was with me in our economic problem. God was with me in the cancer. Though I walked through the valley of the shadow of death, he was with me. And it didn't always feel good. Matter of fact, it hurt. Matter of fact, it sucked. Matter of fact, it was terrible. That's why you call it the valley of the shadow of death. You don't call it that because it's a ride at Disney. You call it that because it sucks. But my faith in God needs to be at the point, and I work on this, and I do not get there, and I grow, and I move closer, and certain things I succeed at, and certain things I fail. But my goal in life is to be like those three punks. They're just cocky little brats. They're in their 20s. They're at the peak of cocky, right? There's nobody in the world knows more than a 20-year-old. God is able to rescue us from the fire. But if he doesn't, I'm still not going to bow to your idols. Right now has been such a time. <laughs> Hasn't this been like the best two years ever? I mean, like, can we just go to the 2030s? Because I'm giving up on the 2020s. I'm just completely, I'm done. They're not going to work out. We, 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 did the, we did the trial, you know, we did the two-year trial of the 2020s. Don't really want to renew for the full 10-season event. I just, I'm good. Let's just move on. There's got to be something else we can rent. It's rough to keep your values. It's rough to hold your principles. It's rough not to get sucked in by some prince or some powerful person who can proclaim an easier path than Christianity. There are a lot of people who got alternate paths out there. Oh, you could do this my way instead of God's way. It'll work out so much better for you. It might work out easier for me. It's not going to work out better for me. So 
but where are we? I'm pretty sure we all need a little truth injection, don't we? A little faith injection, a little trust injection on that. Because things get bad. But God stays present. They took Jesus and he put a crown of thorns on his head and they mocked him and they beat him and they whipped him and they nailed him to a cross that wasn't easy and three days later the best bite we're finishing up the series on bites the absolute best one is when they come to the, temp to the tomb but it's empty See, all this stuff, there comes to an end. There comes to a final time. There is a point. God is working toward his conclusion of history. And the biggest but will be when God erases all the tears, wipes every tear from the eyes. God restores all his creation. God gets the final victory. And while we have had times when we struggled, we have had times when it was difficult, we have had times when it hurt, we have had times when it sucked. God's going to win. Remind yourself of that. Cling to that truth. The truth that the God who raised his son from the dead is going to make all this work out. You may not understand it. You won't understand it. But God's still in control. So I challenge me and I challenge you as you watch the news and you're tempted to find some way to explain everything away, or you're trying to find some way to make it all better, or you're trying to find some way to blame somebody other than your team. Just remember, I'm not going to bow to your idol. I'm not going to lend into your prince. I'm not taking this prince. I'm not taking this excuse. I'm not taking anything. I am leaning on God. I am trusting God. God is able to rescue me, but if he doesn't, Good for him. I trust that he's doing everything for the good. Everything's going to work out the way he wants it to. Well, that was easy, wasn't it? You weren't coming for the comedy routine. But sometimes we've got to face reality, and even when it hurts, we face it. So let me ask you a question. How's your trust right now? been a rough run God still loves you God's still in control God's still working everything out in his way keep trusting him quit trusting them that's write that down that's good they, they've always write these down they just text them to me can, can, can we just before I do anything else I want to just I want to pray right here Father, we live in a heavy world. We, we don't get thrown into furnaces, but we face fires. We, we don't get persecuted the way people in a lot of the world get persecuted, but we still have conflicts, we still have challenges, we still have problems. And Lord, this past couple years, it's been a run. And Lord, if you want to take us out of the fire, that'd be cool. We're not going to object to that. But Lord, go with us through it no matter what. As Moses said, show us your glory in the middle of it. Be in the furnace with us, just like you were in the furnace with those three guys. Father, as we struggle to make sense of things around us, as we struggle to understand this crazy world, help us to remember that it's not going to make sense until you fix it. And Father, if there's anyone here who doesn't have a relationship with you, I may not have made the great case for it yet today. But if they would like a relationship not with God who explains everything away or makes everything easy, but who goes with them through the fire. I pray today they would, they, they, they're here, they grab a blue bag, 
unpack it with them, go online, they'll contact me. And we can show them how to have a relationship with you. Father, we pray right now. We've got people still in harm's way. Keep them safe. Bring them home soon. And Father, for our military friends and family, give them peace in this time. Give them trust in this time. Give them hope through this time. And you be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. A couple things before I get off. If you said if you wanted to, have to accept Christ, we got a blue bag. If you'd like to be baptized, let me know. If you want to talk to us about being part of the church, email steve at spousepringers.org. We'll set that up. And during this next song, if you would like to pray about anything that's going on in your life or other people's lives or anything else, there's a cross in the corner. You can just slide over during the song and pray as much as you want. If you want to pray with somebody, we've got a couple people set up on the outside of the auditorium for that. If you're going to take communion, there's a communion station here, and I think there's one in the back now, too. But my God is able to save. But if he doesn't, going to go with me through the fire.
mountain you won't climb up coming after me there's no wall you won't kick down or lie you won't tear down coming after me there's no shadow you won't light up mountain you won't climb up coming after me there's no wall you won't kick down or lie you won't tear down coming after me for joining us today. Thank you for sharing in our time together. Thank you for joining us online. Those of you here on campus, if you can stack some chairs seven high, we'll come get them. Thank you. Otherwise, we'll see you next time.